Hi, I'm Harry Reeder, Senior Pastor of Briarwood Presbyterian Church, along with Bruce Stallings, our Executive Pastor, for our uh, Sunday evening, 6 p.m., Conversations. Now, it began Conversations on this present distress, but now it's opened up to topics and texts of Scripture, doctrines, uh, various questions, along with the uh, addressing the present distress. And so uh, we're continuing this ministry, and thank you for the questions that you have sent. Uh, we're going to try to get through as many as we can today and, uh, and keep sending them because it looks like we'll be doing this for a, for a while in our phased reopening of ministry under the guidelines of Governor Ivey. Uh, and the specific directives that have been enumerated for us by our state health director uh, that are found on the website. So it wasn't hard to find them, but we had to go get them. And I'm so grateful for the administration at Briarwood, the leadership team that oversees the decisions and the policies of our session. I'm grateful for, and our staff, um, I love the way that they modeled uh, strict social distancing last week, and um, we have seven points of entry and 14 stations, and and there we have the mask and how they shared them with you. you know, we're st we strongly encourage you to use the mask and feel free to use the mask, and and uh, that's a that's a help. And at least that's what our director says, and we certainly want to acknowledge that and make use of that. I'm grateful for how the staff um, um, was there and helped us in all three services and uh, those that led the worship, those that participated, how you went into strict social distancing. I even, it was, uh, Bruce and I both remarked how you were thoughtful in bringing up the offerings yeah. and, uh, and maintaining some distance from one another going up to the offering plate. And, and then beyond that, um, we had our children's church and your children, I mean, it was uniformly commented, your children came in um, like not, normally they're a little rambunctious. <laughs> I mean, you know, sanctified rambunctious, but, uh, but they came in very thoughtfully, obediently, maintained social distance. And, um, and I am so, uh, it obviously parents had talked to their children. So I want to thank you for doing that. Um, and I want to thank you for how you're caring for one another. You know, and that's why my devotional thought today is just simply this. Uh, do not weary in well-doing. I, I just, I love that verse. I need to be reminded of it personally. And first of all, that verse is built upon the fact that you are well-doing, you're doing well. And I want to say from my perspective as a pastor, you are doing well. I know some of these things you may disagree with, some of them you're in, you feel inconvenienced, but for the sake of loving God well, for the sake of loving others well, and uh, loving one another well, and for the sake of loving our neighbors well, uh, you are willingly doing that, and thank you for willingly doing that. And uh, let me encourage you, don't weary in well-doing. Sometimes it can get, you know, sometimes it can, you can just start taking it for granted. Be focused, particularly as a church. Bruce and I, in our communication with the authorities over us in the state and, and publicly, we have tried to make the case, if you can trust a business with profit motive to, uh, to, to, uh, to do this well, to strict social distancing, then how much more should you be able to trust God's people who uh, are not having a personal agenda? We're not engaged in a political statement, but we are trying to love the Lord well, love one another well, and love our neighbor well. And you have exhibited that. I want to thank you for it, but don't worry. We've got another Lord's Day coming, and we'll probably be doing these one, three one-hour services on the Lord's Day morning uh, for the near future at least. Uh, our governor had another statement this week and opened up some aspects, but we're pretty much under the same guidelines as a church, and, uh, and we're, we're trying to do it better, making a few little minor adjustments. If, when we go to Plan D, we'll let you know and we'll keep trying to communicate. Forgive us if it's over-communication, but 
during this time, we want to make sure that things are understood so that we can uh, be a good testimony and we can be an asset in each other's life. So don't weary in well-doing. Bruce, I think we probably have some questions now, right? We do. And you know, Pastor, that, that love for the Lord, that love for each other is so evident in our people. We, as you've referenced, we've We've been given good parameters for a good plan, and we have a good plan. It's a plan on paper, and uh, our congregation's love for each other and love for the Lord uh, is evident. There are no guarantees in a plan, so let's remember to, to bathe that and our gatherings in prayer uh, that no one contract the coronavirus or spread the coronavirus at, uh, with anyone. So we'll continue to trust uh, the Lord. You know, Bruce, I want to maybe say something about someone else I didn't refer to. Yeah, I noticed how the parents had prepared their children. I know how, mm -hmm. noticed how people thoughtfully did and went beyond what they would normally do for the sake of a good testimony and creating a good environment for each other and this strict social distancing. But, but we also had people that weren't here. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we want to, don't weary in well-doing. I know you want to be here, but if you're part of those vulnerable categories, if you have been exposed uh, or someone in your family is exposed, and you're exposed to that someone in your family, uh, or you're part of, like I said, those vul various vulnerable categories. Uh, we un we know that, we understand that, and we're praying for you. And um, and so, thank you for making wise decisions as well. And uh, and you don't weary in well doing. And we're anticipating the day when either by your development and uh, and health, or by uh, by the by the progress we keep making on quote flattening this curve and and the coronavirus that we'll be all be able to be together. Well, Pastor, this weekend is a holiday weekend, really, in two respects, uh, both of which we acknowledge this morning in, in worship. Uh, first of all, it's Memorial Day weekend. So, speak for a moment. I have a question about Memorial Day weekend. weekend. How would you encourage Christians to approach Memorial Day from a biblical perspective? Yeah, Memorial Day actually uh, grew out of a number of various townships in North and South after the Civil War would go to the graves of soldiers and place flowers. And, um, and it was observed, so in Washington, they established uh, at the national cemeteries that had sprung up after the Civil War. Remember, you have over 700,000 casualties, and mm -hmm. likely there were more because of the after effects of wounds after the war. And uh, so you had uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, a loss of uh, manpower between the ages of 15 to 35 and 40. And it was felt in the country, and the grief was in the country. And so they started something, it was called Decorations Day. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it continued on. Uh, and then after World War I, it was moved eventually to Memorial Day and to include all of those who had given, to quote Abraham Lincoln at, um, at, at Gettysburg, the last full measure. Mm. Um, we, you know, we have Veterans Day where we rightly honor all of those who have given themselves to uh, serve in the military for the protection right. of our God-given uh, rights and uh, and for our constitution uh, to b continue to rule the land uh, with um, a freedom governed by law. And so we're grateful we have that on Veterans Day. We celebrate our Independence Day. But Memorial Day is specifically aimed at, um, at remembering those who gave their lives uh, in the various wars to protect this country and its freedoms and their families. We want to be an encouragement to their families as well. So it's been a very important holiday in the life of our nation because, um, and the, the biblical roots, uh, you remember when Jesus said, um, no greater love has this than a man would lay right. down his life for his friends. And uh, so many have done that. They have laid down their life for their fellow citizens to protect them from tyranny with an amazing record throughout history. And, and for that, we give thanks to the Lord. We want to honor them and we want to encourage those families. Of course, for me, that immediately brings me to Jesus, hmm. who not only laid down his life in an atoning death, 
uh, for those who would become his friends, but he did it by dying for those of us who were sinners, helpless, Romans 5, sinners, helpless, and who were his enemies to redeem us. Mm -hmm. And then you see how this can become a Memorial Day, can actually become a great evangelistic tool, and I try to use it that way. Listen, have fun, thankful for the holiday. Uh, but historically, people have taken Memorial Day to remember. Historically, in many places, they use parades and things mm -hmm. like that. But one of the things is to take time with your family and friends at 3 o'clock on Monday and to remember, um, remember those who gave their lives for us. I remember as a little boy growing up, we would go to my grandparents on an offshoot of that, which was the third Sunday in May. That's just what they called it. It was grave decoration. And so the, the day would be spent the day before preparations of the cemetery, and then you would just have that recognition. All I remember was you ate a lot of food. It had to be at least 98 degrees outside, and you just told stories about the, the people who had, who, who had passed away. But that was in preparation for then the Memorial Day, which was just the servicemen and women who had given their life for the country. And boy, it went up a notch. And right. just that recognition and that honor. Right. And so obviously for prayer, we have uh, families in our church who have paid that sacrifice through their family, right. that their uh, children or husbands or wives or, or parents gave their uh, life as a sacrifice for that. And then this year, it just seems to me there's a time to pause because we've had a lot of first responders. I know they don't serve in the military per right. se, but just a reminder right. that we've yeah. had a lot during this crisis to go through. The second holiday I reference is Ascension Sunday. So last Thursday was Ascension Day, 40 days after uh, Resurrection Day was Ascension Sunday, um, Ascension Day, and then today, Ascension Sunday. So why do you think that more churches don't put a recognition, a focus upon Ascension Sunday? Well, of course, our church is part of that strain of the Reformation and evangelical Christianity that basically rejected the mandated church calendar. Mm. Nowhere in the Bible, right. in the New Covenant, are we said, well, we have people ask me, do we, have a, do we have holy days in our church calendar? I say, yes, we have 52 of them <laughs> every year. It's called the Lord's Day. And that's the only place that our conscience is mm. bound. But the church calendar can be used for focused celebration and worship. Uh, as you remember the Advent season, anticipating mm -hmm. the incarnation, as you remember the Holy Week and Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and then the 40 days in, uh, in anticipation of Ascension Sunday, in which Christ was received back into glory. He had, um, he had descended uh, to in the incarnation. He had been humiliated in his incarnation, humiliated in his rejection, humiliated in his atoning death, humiliated by being buried, dead and buried, descending into the uh, into the Hades, the lower regions, and then to, uh, and now exaltation, mm. he's resurrected. Now exaltation, his triumphant ministry of these uh, 15 appearances for 40 days that we have recorded. And then, um, and then his ascension into glory with the promise of his second coming. And so Ascension Sunday was the celebration of Christ's triumphant exaltation and the anticipation that you shall come see him coming again in like manner. Uh, and then so that's what ascension was, as well as the articulation of living the great commandment for mm. Christ and then doing the great commission in the name of Christ to take the gospel to all the nations. So that was the Ascension Sunday. Now, uh, the churches that make use of the calendar basically have what they've done is they've mirrored the three Old Testament. There's five Old Testament feasts, but there are three in particular. And this is a, and the new covenant became a non-obligated, non-mandated, non-conscience binding, yet useful feasting season mm -hmm. around the incarnation, the uh, death, burial, and resurrection, uh, Holy Week, and then Ascension Sunday. Many, of course, would add the next Sunday and tie the two together, Ascension, and then Pentecost Sunday is the next Sunday celebrating the 10 days after the, um, uh, the, the 
celebrating those days after Christ's ascension where they went to prayer in the upper room and the Holy Spirit right. was poured out upon them on Pentecost, which is 50 days after his resurrection. Our next question comes from your new series. You've shifted now to the Apostles' Creed and did your second sermon this morning, which was very good. I bet you can't guess what they asked. <laughs> well, uh, let's see. Descended into hell. He descended into hell. That's right. So I know you're going to get to that, but uh, their question is about the just the phrase, what does that mean, he descended into hell? So without preempting my sermon, and because, in fact, one of the reasons I'm doing this series is because of that hmm. particular phrase, which was the last edited addition to the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed was initiated in the second century uh, by those who, as I said, who had been discipled by those who had been discipled by the Apostles. And it was an attempt to bring a summation of basic essential Christian doctrines mm -hmm. to use in teaching and worship and, uh, and also to protect the church from the various heresies concerning the doctrine of God and the doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of redemption and salvation. So, um, uh, and then the last one that was added, um, a number, uh, uh, about three or four hundred years later, uh, 300 plus years later, was the, he descended into hell. Now, again, let me just say the, the original phrase, that, as soon as we see hell, we immediately, uh, um, we immediately have our, rightly so, our antenna up. Uh, but the original term that was used was Hades. Right. And Hades had a twofold purpose in the New Testament. One, it was a general word referring to the place of the dead. Uh, and it replaced the Old Testament word, um, the Old Testament word of Sheol. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and Sheol and Hades can refer to a place of torment or a general place of the dead. And so uh, that was the word that was used. He descended into Hades. Thus, you have um, three basic interpretations of what they were attempting to do. And I'm just going to beg for the privilege for this questioner to join us on that sermon so I could give the historical context why at that point in time in history was that put into the Apostles' Creed, why was it maintained, and what biblically are they trying to say? And I'm going to try to unfold that. I am obviously heavily uh, dependent upon the insights of the reformers mm -hmm. who basically emptied out worship, including the Apostles' Creed, and determined what should be used in worship and in the catechism and the catechism of the church that is the discipling of God's people. And they used the Apostles' Creed and this. The answer to the question is, why would Calvin and Knox, um, Cranmer, uh, Latimer, Ridley, um, uh, Zwingli, Luther, why would all of the reformers continue to use mm -hmm. this Apostles' Creed, including that last edit? And I'm going to try to give the historical reason for its occurrence and the biblical, uh, the biblical insight that it is attempting to maintain before God's people. They do ask a follow-up question that I think is uh, speaking of what uh, you were just speaking of there. It says, wouldn't then we be supporting the view of a purgatory of sorts when we say he went to hell? Then we'd be in agreement with the Roman Catholics, and then we need to throw out the whole Protestant Reformation so we wouldn't be considered reform at all. Yeah, well, first of all, let's start with the first part of that. There was no doctrine of limbo and purgatory when that was added. Hmm. to the, the doctrine of limbo and purgatory was something that was added later in the overall corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, basically, uh, it was uh, used, my personal opinion, in a manipulative Manipul fashion. Uh, but there was no, at the time the, this was added to the Apostles' Creed, that's not referring to purgatory or limbo because there was no doctrine of purgatory, mm -hmm. uh, a, a purgatory or limbo at that time. Uh, secondly, I don't think you can say the use of it, you throw out the Reformation, because all the Reformers used it. And I don't think you can throw out the Reformers. Uh, so they used it. 
The question ought to be asked is, and this is the right, uh, right question, so I'm grateful for the question, any extra biblical creed that is there to help us understand biblical truth has to be substantiated mm. by biblical truth. Amen. Therefore, we want to know why did they add this one to it? It was the last edit. There were a number of edits to the Apostles' Creed from the second century on. Why was it the last edit historically? What was it put in there for? And uh, there was no purgatory limbo, so it wasn't there to support that. But what was it put in there for? Mm. And uh, that's what we want to see. And is it, does it have biblical foundation? And if so, what is it so that we can profit from it? Because that's what you profit from. A creed is only so profitable as it is faithful right. to the scripture because of sola scriptura. Sola scriptura, the scripture alone is our faith and practice. Our real question is why was it put historically, context, secondly, what, what is it attempting to say biblically and try to understand that? And which also, say, also will require that sermon for me to articulate what it is not saying right. as well as what is it saying. And, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll attempt to take that on. Another question that comes in regard to the Apostles' Creed uh, speaks uh, to the Sola Scriptura. It says, I wonder how this idea that creeds and confessions maintain sound doctrine throughout the church is different from Roman Catholic or Orthodox teaching about the importance of tradition. How do, you, how do creeds, confessions, standards, and traditions align with sola scriptura? Couldn't a Roman Catholic simply say that uh, Reformed Protestants have borrowed their concept of tradition but merely substituted the Reformers for the popes and cardinals? Oh, of course not. Uh, the reform. Well, I mean, thanks for the question, but of course not. The reformers never used confessions and creeds because the Roman Catholic Church used it. Uh, they used creeds and confessions because the Bible uses it. Mm. The Bible is full of creeds and confession. The shortest one is Jesus is Lord, mm. uh, and that was what Christians would confess. Uh, they were expected to confess by the uh, by the empire Caesar is Lord. But they would not. They confess Jesus is Lord. The book of Hebrews, on three different occasions, tells us to make the good confessions, to keep confessing. Uh, the church is confessional, covenantal, and connectional. Those are the three framing marks of the church. And so the question isn't, do you have a confession or not? I mean, if you're a Christian, you have to confess. You confess Christ as Lord. Well, what do you mean by Christ? Mm. That means a confession is that which is put together that here's what we believe the Bible says. The confession is only so good as it's faithful to the Bible. Mm. That's the difference in the Reformed Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Both use creeds, both use confessions, but the confessions and the creeds of the Roman Catholic Church were wrong. They said, you're justified by faith. The, Rome, the reformers said, no, you're justified by faith alone. Mm. They appealed to tradition and the councils. The confession of the, of the church, the reformed church said, councils and creeds may err. Scripture alone is mm. our rule of faith and practice. So while creeds are biblical instruments, that are used, they are only so good as they are biblically faithful. Thus, the, the ultimate um, appeal for any confession or creed <clears throat> is its faithfulness to Scripture. So the difference is the Roman Catholic Church would appeal simply to the creed and the council that established it. Mm. The Reformed Church would say, we use confessions, we use creeds, but we don't appeal to church tradition or church councils because men can err and right. councils can err. That's what Luther is saying. And when he says, when he affirms that many have erred, he said, I have erred. So, uh, so that's why, you know, in preaching, uh, God uses preaching. But you can make the argument, well, I shouldn't listen to preachers because preachers err. <laughs> no, you listen to preachers to see if they're preaching the truth of right. God's Word. And if they are, you let the Lord speak to your heart through the preaching of the Word. Faith comes by hearing the Word of Christ. And so whether it's a confession, a creed, or preaching, or a commentary, the ultimate authority is the Scripture. 
But you don't get rid of instruments. What you do is don't let the instruments have the final authority. It is the Scripture that has the final authority that verifies the usefulness of a creed or a confession. I think, I can't remember whether I did this or not, but I, I may have, to, let me repeat it, because it's one of the prime examples. Recent, uh, well, recently, I guess it's been about eight years ago. <laughs> That's recently for me. <laughs> uh, recently, I was in a debate uh, here in Birmingham, uh, and uh, it became an outreach event. And there were uh, a couple of my, my Orthodox friends and right. a couple of Roman Catholics, and there was me and a Baptist pastor. And the people then went to open questions, and they began to answer. And one person stood up and said, we have made an observation we'd like to ask you about. It seems in every question, the, the Orthodox and Roman church uh, clerics are answering with quotes from the councils and the church fathers. Mm -hmm. And you two, pointing to me and the Baptist pastor, y'all are answering from the Bible. And I, that's where I made my speech. I value Augustine. I value Aquinas. I value all of our confessions and creeds. Mm. But I quote them only so far as they're faithful to the Scripture, and, and, but they are useful. Don't dismiss them. You know, the, the church is like the individual Christian. You are growing and maturing. Mm. Well, the church for 2,000 years has been growing and right. maturing. Sometimes it's wrong. That's the very birth of Briarwood. As a, Briarwood was the host of the first General Assembly, mm -hmm. the PCA. Why did the PCA come into existence in 1973? Why? Because the mainline Presbyterian Church changed the confession. Mm -hmm. Chapter 1, from the Bible is the Word of God to the Bible contains the Word of God. Mm -hmm. We were willing to stay into the church and argue the issues as long as the Scripture was the final court of appeals. But when they, mm. when they in the confession, changed it from the Bible is the Word of God to the Bible contains the Word of God, then you just elevated the confession over the Scripture. Right. There's nothing wrong with the confession. The only thing that is wrong is if the confession is non-biblical. And that's why, but we do not, we want to make use of catechisms and creeds and confessions that are faithful to God's Word because number one, they're an instrument of discipleship. Number two, they're an instrument of worship because the Bible tells us in worship to make the good confession. And then number three, they are instruments of unity. This is the statement from the Bible of where we are in agreement this is what the Bible teaches, and we can walk together. Uh, discipleship, unity, and they are an instrument to protect the church against error. And that's why the PCA came into existence. The confession aired. We went back to the Westminster Confession and the original chapter that says the Bible is the Word of God, not the Bible contains the Word of God. And the original Westminster Confession was used to, uh, to uh, debilitate and defend the truth of the authority of God's Word from the new confession, which abandoned it. So we need to apply the Berean example as it relates to preaching and teaching, they searched the Scriptures to see if these things were true. We should apply that to all creeds. That's right. Uh, all all creeds, confessions. All confessions. You know, I knew when I studied the church that the, when, I, when I was beginning to go toward ministry, the church is connectional, covenantal, and confessional. And then I went to what confession of the church do I think is most faithful to the Word of God? That's the church I want to be a part of. And that's how I ended mm -hmm. up in the PCA, which honors the 101 Apostles' Creed, then goes to the 201 level of the Westminster Confession. And I said that, now I don't agree with every single little point in it, but that system of doctrine and what it says became a point that I was willing to say to other believers and to the world, this is what I believe the Bible is teaching. Mm -hmm. But my authority is not the confession. My authority is the Bible. And this uh, confession is a distillation to declare and to defend the truth. Well, Pastor, I'd love to, to end our conversation tonight just getting your thoughts on a faithful minister that got called home this past week, Ravi Zacharias. You know, may I uh, shamelessly encourage people, if you didn't hear it, to go back to uh, Today in Perspective. I think it was Thursday's program. Uh, we um, 
we did it, but uh, uh, just a small piece of it. Uh, I met Ravi uh, in, in Boston, uh, right outside of Harvard University, when one of my mentors, Jim Boyce, called us up, a number of us there, for the Cambridge Convocation, in which we wrote the Cambridge Declaration, <laughs> a confession. Hmm. We were trying to tell the modern contemporary church, this is what we believe about God, this is what we believe is crucial about worship, this is what we believe is crucial about the Great Commission, et cetera. It was called the Cambridge Declaration. And it was one of these confessions that was used at a time of difficulty to, uh, to give the parameters of biblical truth, the freedoms within there, and then where we stood. Well, um, Ravi was one of the headline speakers. I was enthralled. My heart soared. I was convicted. I was encouraged. I just had to meet him. And thankfully, through Jim, I was able to meet mm -hmm. him. And, um, and then we ended up speaking at a couple of conferences. And I always made it a point to be in everything he spoke. I mean, his grasp of God's word, of his ability to quote lengthy <laughs> texts uh, of, from commentaries and all. I mean, it was just amazing. And we're at his reading. And, he, and my heart lined up with him because you, people have heard me say many times that the parable of the sower teaches us to evangelize everybody everywhere every day uh, and um, in every place and that's what I, I saw in him. He had an office in Oxford hmm. uh, and because he went to Oxford so much. Uh, you can search the YouTube, the present press secretary for the White House, uh, she she, write, she gives a testimonial hmm. to how Ravi, when she was at Oxford, God used him in her life. And, um, you know, I, I was just so drawn to it. And then we had a conference. Then we had him here for a apologetics conference. We hmm. had him here for a missions conference. And he, he and I did a conference that here in Birmingham. And um, my assignment was the doctrine of hell. And he had, and then I couldn't wait to get over to hear him. And, um, and it was just, um, in fact, that's the last picture I have with Ravi hmm. is from that. And, um, and so I, um, I, and when we talked, I found out his roots were uh, after his conversion. He was actually converted when he was an Anglican and eventually came into Ontario Bible College and the Christian Missionary Alliance. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, overs over th um, oversight there. Well, um, you know, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, but precious in our sight is the death of his saints. And when someone has given themselves unflinchingly to serve Christ with humility yet boldness, um, we miss that person. Amen. And I really miss him. Um, I'm grateful for him. I pray that RZIM, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, is mm -hmm. able, has, they have over 200 evangelists, I think it oh, is. Yeah. And I pray that that will continue. And, uh, and I will up, want to uphold that in prayer. But he is going to be missed. Uh, a true Christian gentleman who boldly and with humility would take Christ. And here was my great lesson from him. He would defend the faith and try to win the skeptic. That's right. He always defended the faith. It wasn't, well, I don't try to win the argument. I try to win the person. No, he tried to win the argument mm -hmm. very graciously and very boldly. But he did it to win the person yep. that he was dealing with. And, and when he would deal with the person, he would deal with the person by winning the, uh, by attempting to win the argument for the sake of all these young Christians that were looking at him. So he, would, to me, was the epitome of 1 Peter 3, 1. Always be ready to give an account of the hope that is within you, yet with gentleness and reasonableness. And uh, that was what he was able to do. And I learned from him. I learned from him, and I learned by watching him. I fall well short of the standard he set, but I'm very grateful for him and I, I know I'm going to miss him and, I, and this kingdom is going to miss him yet Ravi's not with us but here's what Ravi would say Jesus is Amen. and that's all you need he will be with you I marvel his ability and you can see many recordings he would be in a room on a liberal college campus and a, you know a, a young person's going to you know stump Ravi Zacharias and they would ask an arrogant pointed directed question and he not only would give, just what you were saying, he would not only give that answer for the masses, but he spoke to that person 
and to their heart. And you could feel him wanting the Lord to work in that particular person's heart. So uh, we praise the Lord for uh, his ministry. Yeah, a lot of times the evidence of God's grace is when someone doesn't display it, yeah. but you continue to display it. And Ravi did that well. Amen. Well, that's all we have time for. Uh, please continue to send your questions to ask the pastor at briarwood.org.